Hey, welcome back once again to your favorite time of the week. It's Disruptive AF, the edge of innovation with myself, Trigger Jordan, and my pal of, uh, well, intelligence and uh, smartness and deliberate, intentional discussion, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Dan, right here on, on Disruptive AF. You know, every week we love bringing you content that is applicable to you of how not only you can get involved in the defense innovation space, but also realistic, tactical, useful, applicable information that you can actually use in your life each and every day. And today I am so excited to have with us uh, Kaylee, who Kaylee Shanda, who uh, not only has uh, the experience of being a public affairs officer, but really has an awesome background of having worked in the, the uh, commercial sector uh, with a technical company, has a background of creative uh, writing uh, and literature. So she not only does she understand kind of the creative space, but also the technical space. So Kaylee, welcome welcome to the Disruptive AF podcast. And super excited about not only being able to talk about your background, but also uh, some of the things that you're really passionate about with data uh, and, and diving into the kind of the technical realm. So Kaylee, welcome. Welcome to your favorite podcast. <laughs> oh yeah, my my favorite. How did you know? Uh, thank you for for having me. I'm, super you excited. I'm so ready to have this conversation. So, yeah. It's good. Well, for, first, let's start off with a little bit of your background, um, because I found it really interesting. You know, in the before the show started, we were talking about some of the technical and data principles. But then, when you look at your your resume and kind of your background, uh, you have a uh, a background master's of, of science in strategic communication, uh, literature, creative writing, and in my mind, most of the time, you don't see kind of the engineer de technical data people uh, paired with creative writing and <laughs> literature. So, what was that? Uh, a little bit about a. About your background you started in kind of the literature creative space but then you found yourself in the technical space how did that happen yeah so actually my degree yes is in literature and creative writing but before that i um i found myself in mostly science and math classes before i actually made that that turn so um while i didn't get a degree in math and science i've taken several math and science classes so i i think i bridge that in just what i was interested in in college in general um but yeah i i got into advertising straight out of college and then i moved into sales and marketing and then um from there i got into an account management um position at a tech company and and the way it happened is i ended up creating a job that i wasn't actually hired for <laughs> so i was hired to be an account management um helping the account director mm -hmm in more of an admin role and just sort of helping her her handle her clients and um it quickly turned because of the background that i had in statistics from the classes that i took um and and just my desire to analyze data um personally i created more of a niche role where i analyzed all of our clients data um on a weekly monthly and quarterly basis um so that's kind of how i i created that and i don't really know how it happened other than it being an interest of mine and and kind of love yeah. the draw being pulled into a job that allowed me to to flourish in that area a little bit more so that background yeah, so feels really good. unique to me because mostly people fall into either the creative arts and like that you know the the stuff that i'm really into they call it that touchy-feely emotional you know paint on the wall um and then the quantitative the data analytics can you like that must be, I, I don't know, I feel like that makes you some kind of unicorn. Uh, how are you uh, like putting those two practices together in your work? I, I think you would be surprised at how many more people um, would do both if they didn't limit themselves because of the type of thinking of like, oh, I'm either creative mm. or I'm yeah. mathematically or scientifically inclined. Um, I think you. I think people would be surprised if they explored it. For me, I, uh, I'm interested in like almost everything. in In the sense of like, I want to try yeah. everything. I want to learn as much as I possibly can. And and one of the things that I think I am fortunate just by nature is like I I get things right. I just kind of understand to an extent, and then I poke at it, um, and I pull those threads. And so I think that's why I've been able to have the creative side of doing graphics and art and things like that, but also being interested in which naturally I'm more inclined to be mathematically um, capable of doing things. Um, I just I have interests. We, I, think, yeah. I think it's just interests where I've pulled threads that I think, I think anyone you know, could really do. When you, when you talk about 
when you talk about data, it, this is so interesting to me because I think a lot of times when you talk about the innovation space, a lot of what happens in innovation tends to be data driven. And I hate that it is data driven. And I, I feel my perception is an incorrect way that we analyze data incorrectly. We set up the data architecture infrastructures incorrectly. We, we are collecting data in, in inappropriate ways. And, and I don't mean like inappropriate, but inappropriate ways such that you're not able to correlate it correctly later on the back half, uh, which has left you, it leaves you to have to interpolate data that really isn't meant to be correlated in any any capacity but it's too late and you have to go back and that that really creates a problem in the innovation space when you're talking about technical and process technical and processes because when you know it, the higher you go in leadership the more uh payout or the more savings or the more efficiency they want to see and many 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 times just from, from my own experience i can say well where's the data where's the data where's the data that proves this and unfortunately there are decisions that are made based on a lack of data. And we put so much emphasis on the data and the data collection that even if it's bad data, we count it as a good data point or a, or a good correlation, which, yeah. you know, you, when you say, when you see that, that is a massive problem because if you have corrupted data and you make, you, you know, you make decisions off of that, you're making an uninformed decision. So if you can, just when you're talking about your experience before, how is it that you go about correctly being able to identify what data is good? And I know this is a loaded question, but just the principle conceptually, how do, how do people line? You know, when we're talking in the innovation space, and that's very much of a real concern that people constantly want this data to make decisions. Um. So it is a very loaded question. I'm gonna start with saying that I am comfortable with not knowing things. And I think in society, we have a really big complex with the answer, I don't know, not just in the military. I think people have a problem saying, I yeah. don't know, yeah. because there's so much information out there that you feel like you should know. You feel like if you're pulling numbers, they should be able to equate to knowledge. When in mm -hmm. reality, I don't think numbers equate to knowledge. I think numbers give you a um, somewhat factual basis to supplement what you're able to observe as a person. We are not yeah. human doings, like we're human <laughs> beings, right? Oh, and so yeah, you can't yeah. place yeah. a number on um, on human factors specifically. Yeah. Um, and even when you're when you're pulling things that that don't equate to um, maybe human nature, because on on the public affairs side, we're we're really focused on people, right, and communication yeah. and what that looks like. Um, in it's kind of a gray area, it's very it's not black and white. It can't be black and white. And I think um, what you find oftentimes is that people want to be able to call a thing a thing, even if they don't know what that thing is. And so they get a number. And they say, I know what this thing is and I feel comfortable now that I know something because I don't like not knowing. So they place a comfort in knowing, right? Um, quote yeah. unquote, knowing something. When in reality, I think to approach data and to approach technology and to approach actual understanding, you have to take a step back and say, I don't really know, but what I can tell you and what I can give you is a picture of a certain point in time that more or less accurately describes part of a collective um, yeah. and recognizing that this may change um, and, and knowing that nothing is really absolute. Even science is not absolute. It's absolute in the moment, right? It's not inaccurate, but that doesn't mean it's not subject to change. Um, and yeah. I, I think sometimes we want to be absolute versus understanding um, that things change constantly. Um, this yeah. feels so relevant to like, I just finished taking the joint special operations universities course in military design, the fundamentals of design. And one of the things that, that, that they talk about a lot is being uh, accepting of what the reality of complex systems is, which is that in a complex system, like any human system, really, all you can get are snapshots of pieces of the system and no model of that system will ever truly accurately depict a complex system. The only accurate model of a complex system is the system itself. 
Um, and it's something that we, uh, you know, that kind of speaks to me personally and my efforts to bring design and fit like design thinking facilitated discovery practices, because one of the most important parts of that is that, that we're trying to teach people in our, in our introduction to discovery course is getting comfortable with staying in that space where you're like, I don't actually, I don't actually know. I'm being open to new realities to present themselves, you know, which I think is exactly what you're referring to with. We, we tend to, when we're in that uncomfortable cognitive space of, no, I don't actually understand the problem, to just grasp at whatever numbers we can get our hands on and be like, this tells me that we're here or that the system oh, means man. this. And yeah. it, that is a dangerous, it takes us down these really, I mean, we invest a ton of money on half-cocked theories uh, with minimal data points to, to suggest that we should even be investing. An incredibly uh, re relevant example of this that that just recently we've been living, I say recently in the last couple of years, but when you talk about the, the transformation of really any process for us specifically, um, and then the pilot training realm, and it's been this mindset, there's a pilot training next focuses on kind of integrating a new mindset of training and learning and instructing with uh, technology. Um, so in, in an effort to figure out, you know, how do you scale that effort, the good principles from that to multiple pilot training bases, there was several of us who were involved who, as seasoned instructor pilots, you look at it and you say, this is going to work. Like, this is going to work. But when you tell people about it, they say, but yeah, you have no data. So it's not, this is not going to work. Like, how do you prove this? And you literally had to get to a place where you had commanders, uh, but for them to be able to approve it, they would say, you know what, dude, I trust you. I just need a this or a this from you. Are the students where they need to be? Or are they not where they need to be? And for those of you who are listening, I give a thumbs up and a thumbs down because you may not be able to say it. But, <laughs> but, but uh, and, and people would say, well, that's not near enough data. But hold on. There's a lot of data there because the data points, just like you were talking about, Dan, what you're not incorporating is you may say, well, you don't have any data based on the students. But there's a lot of data based on the experience, the years of experience, the years of training, the years of exposure that all of your seasoned instructor pilots are inputting into the system. And they are data points. And those data points are telling you something that this process is going to work, that there is something to this. So just because, and this is kind of a good segue, uh, I think, into what you something you mentioned earlier, Kaylee, j that just because you may not see the objective analysis or data that you think you need it does not mean that there's not evidence uh, in the subjective proof that there is something good happening. And that's, that's, I mean, that's a very weighty statement, but I just want to say that one more time so we get that is, is that just because you may not be able to articulate objective quantifiable data does not mean there's not something good happening in the innovation space. It, all of the good may actually only be able to defined by the subjective qualitative data, which for whatever reason, our, a lot of times our system doesn't like that. Why? Are you asking me why? Because I don't yeah, really know. I mean, I it's mean, not it's, a rhetorical yeah. question. I, I'm a legitimately curious, curious, curious that why when we do these, you know, evaluations of technology or processes or companies that we only try to focus upon the objective quantitative data versus subjective qualitative data, because there's a lot in that. There's a lot of experiences. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of exposure that people have that is impossible to objectively qualify or quantify, but it is easy to qualify. Yes, through observation and experience, right? So that's, yeah. that's where I think um, to get a full picture, you can't rely only on quantitative data because it kind of goes back to what we were saying. People are not data points. Things are not just data points. There is a quality to them. Um, yeah because there's a quality to everything that anyone ever does for the most part when it comes to making decisions and, and taking action. Um, there's, there's always a quality to it. And, and you're right, there, is, there are tons of observation points where you can say, hey, I don't necessarily have numbers unless I assign numbers to it, right? Unless I turn my qualitative yeah. observations into quantitative data that you're gonna be able to digest. Um, which you can do it, it's hard and it takes a lot of time that's that's yeah. that's i think that's the inherent issue too is that qualitative data takes time you yeah. have to be able to look at it over an extensive period of time to have and you have to have 
a copious amount of data points because you can't have a small sample size and think that you know everything. Um, yeah. and, and the more you have in your sample size over the course of several years, the better you're gonna be able to say this. But I think to your point um, is, yeah, you do have people who have experienced all these things and are saying, this is my experience. And you, and you record that over and over and over again. And you're saying, okay, wow, let me look at this. All of these people have the exact same experiences. I don't have a number for that, but hmm, maybe there's something to it if yeah. there are two unrelated people who are bringing me the exact same viewpoint. Um, and then maybe you can dive into it a little bit further. And I, I, I do think that um, for better or for worse, sometimes you ignore the qualitative side of it because it takes time. And so data yeah. is supposed to make you more efficient, whereas looking at something and, ob and observing it maybe not be as efficient as I say, quote unquote, right? I'm doing the quotes efficient yeah. because um, it just inherently takes more time. I like to say, I mean, this is numbers. something that I've ranted about a number of times on, on this podcast and, and basically anywhere else I've ever been in my life is that in, innovation is not efficient though, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think that's part of the reason is because um, we, we can't just set up a process and part of it is because humans are complex, right? We can't just set up a process and expect it to just keep functioning within the system to gather the information that we need to to operate efficiently forever because the users change, the context changes, the meaning of the value we were trying to create changes. And in order to actually fix that, what we need is to gather uh, that qualitative information that tells us whether we're creating the value we intended to. Um, and I, I actually think that this is extremely relevant to the fact that you're in the public affairs space, because something that I've been saying for a long time is that part of the part, part of the one piece of, of gathering that qualitative data is telling stories. And that's kind of the role that I've taken uh, in, in in a lot of my efforts, extracurricular to promote innovation, is to tell stories of when we did have and when we didn't have innovation occurring. And I've seen that be pretty significantly influential in the way that people view the issue, more influential than just the the numbers game, which is what most of us are playing most of the time. Yeah, um, and I think too, when you are looking in the communication space, we exist in the information world. Um, and our weapon of choice is the truth, right? So, yeah. um, but how can you express the truth without observation? It's not really yeah. possible. Um, yeah. Or at least the truth is you see it, right? Because everyone has a different truth. But um, there are cold, hard facts. And, and that's where that's where we exist. But telling those stories um, in a way that people are going to want to hear, that's where that data comes in. Because being able to analyze whether or not you're effective is, is I think, more important than always being efficient about something. Um, and doing something for a purpose is so much more effective than doing a thing in and of itself for the sake of doing said thing. Yeah. And before before uh, we started recording this this episode, I brought up the theories of, of Dave Snowden and I wasn't going to dig into them because they get really kind of they they get into the weeds really a lot. But one of the I do want to mention that one of the theories that he has about navigating in complexity is that um, if you if you can convince a population to serve as ethnographers of their own experience, then the qualitative data that you need to to decide how we're supposed to be act, acting, it'll kind of emerge on its own, as opposed to what we have to do right now with, within the current culture of the Air Force, which is like pulling teeth to get qualitative data. It is, it's impossible. And we've, we've seen this with a lot of cultural issues, you know, with the resiliency crisis and, and with, you know, now recently with racial issues, um, we're we're now having to try and figure out how to gather that qualitative data from people's experience to speak openly and to feel, you and know, like Kinsley, you want to hit on that? I, I, I do that, that qualitative piece. Um, I, I just got to be able to voice this real quick is that even in the times where decisions are made, the, the hardest part is what you know, somebody's going to, somebody's going to allow you to do something to be able to move forward. Say this, say you have a project and they say, okay, yeah, continue moving forward. It, it, it uh, there's almost this pressure to give a disclaimer at the beginning of before you move forward to say, just so you know, 
I don't have a data capture structure to be able to tell you six months from now the efficiency that's being created by this process, but I'm telling you, I know it's going to work. You're going to have to trust me. There's like this just pressure, and I am no, I'm not the only one that's felt it, that it's like when you do get approval for something, you feel like I need to type up a contract of disclaimers to say, okay, well, here's your user, you, here's your user agreement. Thanks for giving me the numbers. But just so you know, I'm not going to have the data you think or that in the back of your mind you're expecting me to have after this. I'm just going to need you to trust me that the result of what you're seeing is enough. And, and, and there's been several times, man, Dan, I'm sure that you've seen it, Kaylee and, and Jordan, I'm sure you guys have seen it as well, that it's, I feel like there's almost this disclaimer that has to be given. And I hate that that disclaimer has to be given. Um, but that's kind of the environment that we're in now, especially, you know, Dan, you said something really that I th thought was awesome and incredibly true. The innovation is not efficient. It's kind of this, this nature of, of, I, 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 you know, Daniel Coyle in his book, The Culture Code, talks about ch uh, kids that are just kind of grabbing things and trying to fix things and put them together. That yeah. in in that effort, that in the effort of doing that, it may not look like an efficient system of these kids building these spaghetti towers and they're just yanking spaghetti sticks out of each other's hands. But the result is they're actually more efficient and effective than the most educated of teams that have attempted that. Why mm -hmm. is that? Is because there is efficiency in the chaos. And there is goodness without some of the objective data, but we have to be in a system that allows that playground to exist, which, yeah. which really, I mean, that gets to a whole discussion of, of, you know, how do you create that culture and whatnot, but that's a whole nother discussion. So going back to the data, Kayla, when you do that, like what is some of the advice that you'd be able to give people that when you're talking about, um, you know, decisions of cost savings or things like that, where if you're in this environment, uh, how do you communicate that? to leaders that that may be very objectively quantifiably driven because in the innovation space communication is probably more important than maybe some of the actual tactical movements of the yeah. uh, technology and the process itself i mean frankly innovation lives and dies off of our ability to, to communicate it yes Right, you can't have the diffusion of innovation without it spreading and getting that tipping point of people actually knowing about it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Through communication, um, and you know that that's a tough question that I don't think I quite have an answer to as far as um, how you're going to get someone who's objectively driven to listen to you when you don't have those objective points. Um, I, I think what you can come armed with, that um, at least in the public affairs realm and, and the communication realm. What you can come armed with are um, theories, for one, which is kind of boring. A lot of people don't like to read, you know, communication theories and psychological theories, theories and social theories and, and all the things. But you can. You can understand human behavior. We have been studying human behavior since human beings were able to study human behavior. So we've been doing it for a really long time. And, and I don't quite buy that we don't have qualitative data. We do have qualitative data. It's called history. And it's uh. called theory based on on observation and watching yeah. people um and again those all evolve they change everything's subject to change but you know what has or hasn't worked in the past because you've seen it and even though like i like to think of moving forward as instead of people people tend to think like oh we're moving forward on a path right so you're, it's a linear path and you're moving forward or people are like oh we're moving up as if like you're walking up a staircase i tend to think of moving forward is more of like a spiral staircase where yes, you are moving up, you are moving forward, you're moving to a different level, but you're always gonna come back over those some of those same points that are inherent to human culture that I think um, we don't always focus on because while you do evolve and you do change, there are some things that don't change. And, and I, I think a lot of the times we leave out the things that we already know for the sake of saying like oh this is new and this is innovative and this is this is um something that we've never done before but it is something we have we have done before just yeah differently right um yeah. that i i think we don't always pay attention to and, and yeah no, I, I hear a lot of people talk about uh, with what you're talking about this isn't necessarily new well that uh, evolutionary versus revolutionary innovation and the majority of what i've seen is evolutionary and that's totally fine Mm -hmm. That's fine because it's right. making a difference. It's yeah. it's changing yeah. the way things are done and making it better for people's lives. What's wrong with that? What's there's wrong nothing. With that? There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Um, and I think you. I mean, you made up a good point. I, I've never really thought of it with the two terms side by side: evolutionary versus revolutionary. But 
but we don't always need something that's revolutionary when you're talking about becoming more efficient, right? You're, you, you're not going to make something brand new. And I think that's where a lot of people get into to the habit of being like, this doesn't work. I need to make something new so that it works instead of um, in certain cases, sometimes that happens. Sometimes th some things are so broken that you have to say, okay, this is, this is too broken. We need to start from the ground up and start brand new. But in a lot of cases, there's nothing too broken that you can't um, evolve out of and say, hey, these are really great aspects of whatever technology it is that we're using. But because technology has advanced, we can do it slightly differently. And yeah. it's going to make a huge change, um, exponential change in a lot of cases, because that's how time works. But yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, hey, Dan, before we get a break, you had something to share there, and I don't want to miss that before we get off the thought. Yeah. Um, well, I was thinking of another, uh, this other sort of metaphor that I, that I started using in a, in a course that we're building for discovery practices, which is a lot of what we're talking about is discovery to figure out, like you're talking about, uh, figuring out the value we're actually trying to create, which will let us know if we need to scrap the whole system and start over or, It'll, it'll actually help us diagnose if we actually understand the value that we're trying to create. And I think too many people don't understand that value. But the metaphor I've been using uh, to describe why it's necessary to have inefficient kind of in innovation processes is, the, um, is like if you were mountain climbing and you could only see for about 15 feet because of the fog, um, just because one direction seemed like it was up, that doesn't mean it's the direction to the peak of the mountain you're trying to climb. Because yeah. when you're actually mountain climbing, a lot of times, like you significant amount of the time, you're going downhill. And that means in the idea space, exploring ideas that don't necessarily look like they're going to pay off. And it, it, it means exploring and understanding the problem space completely, which it involves, you know, kind of living in that cognitive dissonance of I don't know, kind of like we were saying earlier, for longer to give yourself time to understand like the value that we intend to create here. Um, so that was just like a metaphor that I hit on recently where I was like, you know, how, how do I convey this to people, the necessity for yeah. getting qualitative experiences, for getting, you know, data points that don't feel like they're headed in like that direction of like fast now, higher efficiency immediately um, is because most of the time for most of our processes, and I'd argue because of poor knowledge management of poor storytelling in the past, um, that we, we, a lot of the things we do, we don't really know why we do them. Um, the people executing. Uh, and I think that maybe as storytellers, as communicators, as, uh, as innovators, we could be doing a better job of passing on that information to, to yeah. the people coming after us. Yeah. Yeah, hey, we're going to take a quick break right here on Disruptive AF. But when we come back, we're going to talk and be talking about just what Kaylee was mentioning, how you can take that qual those qualitative experiences and actually potentially objectify those such that even if you have somebody who says, hey, I need to see the data, you can look at those experiences and draw conclusions from them that, that are able to help you in the innovation environment. We'll be right back here on Disruptive AF. Make sure that you subscribe and hit the bell for your information. We'll check you right back here in just a second on Disruptive AF. Defense innovation is made possible by the power of community and collaboration, which is why AFWorks created a chat workspace, the Innovators Chat, where you can connect with other like-minded innovators. Join more than 400 defense entrepreneurs already on the platform to discuss topics like software development, policy innovation, funding resources, books, and media, and more. Find more at afworks.af.mil. Hey, welcome back to the Disruptive AF Podcast. I am Daniel Holter here with my co-host, Kinsley Trigger Jordan. And we've been talking to Kaylee Shonda, who is the uh, the inimitable unicorn lieutenant public affairs officer 
out of the 30th space wing um, and and was just kind of digging into some of the different issues with uh, the way that we gather qualitative versus quantitative data. Um, and it's really interesting to hear that you kind of straddle the line between those two worlds. Um, and, and I think it's really important that uh, we get that perspective uh, from those two worlds. And while we were on break, Jordan, uh, our, our, you know, our producer of this podcast. I'm sorry, words are escaping me. I can't have trouble describing. Producer Jordan. sounds good. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so uh, was, <laughs> yeah, had a really insightful question. Jordan, can you, can you just re restate your question about the, the kind of discrepancy here between viewpoints on the, on this issue of data collection? Of course. Yes. So, so listening to the discussion for the first half, I kind of was hearing from from uh, Trigger, who is more in the pilot career field and, and like pilot training next and doing all of that versus Kaylee, who's in public affairs like I am in the two different worlds and kind of the leadership that we have and what they're expecting from us as we do anything innovative or just work day to day. And what I was noticing is that Trigger often focuses on how do we focus more on the, uh, the qualitative data and using that as something um, and, and to do something innovative or work on a project and show the proof of, of the impact versus the public affairs side where we, we focus far less on the quantitative data and we focus more on qualitative. So it's like going back and forth in these two different worlds and what we use on a regular basis and how we kind of bridge, bridge that gap. So I was curious from, from Kaylee, it's like when, when we actually go into working on any, any project or exploring how do we make sure something is effective? What does kind of that process look like? Um, so we're not just using one source of data over another, but what what, do, what does that process look like? Yeah, so um, I, think, I think we're starting to get to the point where um, public affairs understands that data is very important for what we're doing. So um, I don't wanna discredit in any way that we're not collecting data because we are. I think we're, we're to the point now where we've we've created a practice to be able to say, hey, here are our data points, um, and how can we turn those into meaningful data points? And so, to your point, we do we observe a lot and we watch people and we inherently know how people are going to react because um, our our career field is very subjective. And the more you watch people and the more you have an understanding of people, the more you know. And you can just say, hey, ma'am, sir, I don't I don't have the numbers for you, but I'm I'm listen to me. I'm telling you, I know this is how it's going to work. And and oftentimes they they do listen to you because because you have been right in the past or public affairs has been right in the past, right? Um, but to go back to how to get them to make decisions based on quantitative um, data is we need to evolve in the data that we are looking at. So that means that we remove ourselves from the vanity metrics that we look at typically, such as likes and reach and things along those lines. And how can you actually um, pull the numbers for engagement to, to, to supplement the strategy that you're coming up with. I think what we get stuck with sometimes is implement, 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 and we forget the research part, we forget the plan part, and we forget the evaluate part. Um, and with that evaluation, you have to really make a conscious effort to look past um, those vanity metrics, like I mentioned, and, and pull in to your CSV file and do those pivot tables and act look typically um, because you can't you can't make a decision off of this data point um, and we have so many quantitative points available to us that you can bridge what you qualitatively know about an audience um, and back it up with with data if you look at it through the lens of um, storytelling and, and what that actually means so to do that I think we need to evolve um, long story short, to, to create meaningful data points that are going to be like, okay, yes, this means something to me now. So I, I think that's actually relevant to another thing that, that you've expressed kind of interest in, which is bridging the gap between communities and getting alignment. Um, I, you know, I can't help but think looking at your background and, you know, like that it kind of straddles these different worlds. I can't help but think of the book uh, that I finished a couple weeks ago called The Medici Effect, which talks about the importance of uh, of creating those those convergence points of different disciplines, and that that intersection is where the most innovation happens. Um, and I think that uh, the Air Force could do a better job of facilitating th that convergence of different fields of of you know for a number of reasons, innovation being 
just one of them, but also to achieve kind of strategic or values-based alignment. Do you want to talk a little bit about how that might apply to, to your career field? Yeah. So um, I think we all get caught in a rat race, right? And you say, okay, we need to do, 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 do. And this goes back to what you were saying. I don't know if it was when it was recorded or when we were just having a conversation, but giving people the why. And that's not to mm -hmm. say, oh, I'm explaining myself so that you feel like you do it. It's to have those conversations to bridge it so that not only can other people hold you accountable, but you can hold yourself accountable to say, we're doing this for a purpose. We're doing this because it has value. We're not doing it because we work nine to five and we have to be doing something from nine to five. Um, and I think I'm very purpose driven. I don't like doing anything for the sake of doing it. Um, 99 times out of a hundred. Right. So, yeah. um, there always has to be value on the other side of that. And I think the way you do that is you create spaces to have these types of conversations and you have to create that space in the office. And it's so much easier said than done. Don't get me wrong, um, especially in public affairs. But how can we effectively look at what we're doing and say, yes, this story, this public affairs product, this is telling something because it's meaningful to um to the strategy, it's meaningful to the goal. And I think oftentimes we we fail to um, to define our goals in a way that we can actually say, hey, look, we're meeting our goals. Um, and, and I have seen a lot of conversations in the public affairs uh, realm that makes me really excited to be in, um, in the career field because we are starting to have those conversations a lot more between, um, between officers and between enlisted members to, to be able to say, hey, I don't want to spin my wheels for no reason. I want to do something that's valuable because it is actually meaningful to the mission. Um, and, and I can only see things getting better from here, having, having those conversations. And that's how you bridge some of those things is to be able to collaborate laterally um, between yes. your counterparts, um, not just up and down the chain because someone said so. And it's like, oh, this is the line of effort. Here you go, here you go, here you go, down the chain, down the chain, right? It's like, Hey, you know, sister wing, Hey, counterpart. Um, what are you doing? How can we collaborate together to tell the bigger picture story in a way that's meaningful? Right. Um, and I think that lends itself to a lot of dreamy digital tools that could be out there to digitally <laughs> collaborate laterally and up and down the chain, uh, kind yeah. of ubiquitously, right. Um, without, without it, with it being something that you could actually just go grab and get versus yeah. something that you have to foster every single time you want to answer. I think that's also part of the issue is that we don't have a space where you can just go do it. You have to go foster it and you have to go chase it, which makes it yes. all the more daunting because you're like, oh, that bad in and of itself is work, right? So how can you easily well, yeah. create that space is, is something that... Yeah. Is it Actually, I'm, I'm, Kaylee, I'm reminded of something. Hit me, um, just re remind me after when we're done with the podcast because I just just did literally think of, of, a, uh, of a capability that yeah, I've seen floating around in AppWorks um, that may be able to help you and PA to be able to do that. So we'll talk about that offline. Um, so don't forget don't forget to remind me. But one of the things um, that you'd mentioned that I think is, is uh, a pretty consistent theme that comes up no matter who we're talking to. You know, last week we had on, or a couple episodes uh, ago we had on uh, Chief Simmons. We were talking about, you know, the, per the perspective and passion of connecting people, not just to their passion, but having compassion. This really goes to the art of communication and the art of communication to people about something of whatever that something is. And really when it boils down to it, when you talk about the innovation space and you talk about, um, you know, whether, whether you're talking about evolutionary innovation or revolutionary innovation, there is no innovation if there's not communication about it. You can have the best idea in the world and if all it ever does is live in your mind, it never exists, for all intents and purposes, it never existed. existed. If all it does is stay at the squadron and your squadron uses it, guess what? It never existed. It was never something that became useful or efficient or effective to anybody and that's one of the things that has missed so many, so many times. And frankly, I think it's really why a lot of people find themselves frustrated is because the message of the goodness of what they've been working on isn't clearly articulated or shared. And I yeah. know, you know, we've had uh, some of our uh, uh, other PA brethren on before. Brethren and sisterin, is that a word? I just made it up. Um, uh, 
uh, uh, Cistern. Uh, we've had them on before, and this continues to be a consistent theme, but something I don't think we can just let go is that uh, we have to, being an innovator in the space isn't just a technical focus, it's not a process focus, it's not just a design focus. Um, you have to find a way to communicate it. Without communication, it's going to wither up and die on the vine. And then, it, then what was the point of it? You know, you have to be able to do that. So as we're talking about this data, you know, we've had two really kind of incredibly interesting conversations. Some of it is very technical on the data side, both objective, subjective, qualitative, quantitative data. But how do you, then you have this other piece of how do you communicate those things? <laughs> yeah. you, you know, you, you, how do you communicate that? And, and it's some of the challenge of, you know, some leadership wants to see quantitative, some leadership cares more about the qualitative, but the reality, the art is not necessarily in the data, as I'm hearing you say, it's more out of finding a way to communicate what actually is important, whether it's objective, whether it's subjective, whether it's qualitative, whether it's quantitative, finding how to communicate that. Yeah, it is an art, as you said, right? And I think this kind of goes back sometimes. I'm like, oh, you're just going to have to trust me. These are the words you're supposed to use, right? Yeah. I don't have anything that says, well, <laughs> these are the words. Here, yeah. Yeah. here this word works, you know, 95% of the time. Um, no, I, I, I think um, when it comes to communication, oftentimes I think we fail to also have a goal within our communication. We're like, okay, here's a story. Let me tell the story for the story's sake. When you're like, okay, what am I trying to do? Am I trying to evoke mm -hmm. an emotion? Am I trying mm -hmm. to um, increase action? And am I trying to increase awareness? Um, we always talk about in public affairs, knowledge, attitude, behavior, right? So what, when you're, when you're talking about communicating, are you trying to increase knowledge are you trying to affect behavior um, or are you trying to change someone's attitude about something? And that's going to, that's really going to, what it boils down to is what is your communication goal? And there are plenty of tools and theories to say, Hey, if you look at communication theory, I mean, there's so much of it that, that you can say, Hey, my goal is to um, change an attitude. Right. Um, and then, yeah. and then you work with, within, whatever space it is, whether that's to make someone happy or make someone angry or make someone excited or whatever the case is, mm -hmm. you speak to the things that excite them by understanding who your audience is um, and using, using language that evokes a certain type of sentiment in order to hopefully um, change a behavior. And behavior is hard to change, right? Or yeah. an attitude, anything's really hard to change because people have to accept it. Um, but I think what you have to do too is engage in conversation after the fact. You can't just say, okay, here's my innovation. Here's why it's great. Here's why you should like it. I'm telling you to do it. Here's my story. Read it. Watch it. Great. Now we're done. No, the work is on the back end of being able to engage and have conversations about it so that there's actually a shared meaning because you can't um, symbols, right? Words, letters video things that you see like they only mean what they mean individually to a person until they're shared meaning so that you guys are talking about the same thing so that yeah, shared meaning yeah. comes from engaging after the fact and and continuing conversations not just saying okay here you go here's your information wipe your hands and you're done it, it yeah. it's more than that and it, there's a lot to share so i think i think we struggle sometimes with how do you engage in everything that's important to every single person. Um, and that's where strategy yeah. is involved. And you say, hey, this is really great. I want to help you communicate this. But at the end of the day, is is the audience big enough, right? Who is this for? We mm -hmm. have to determine that in order to make sure that we can put the proper resources towards it to make it meaningful because I don't want to do it if it's not going to pay out. Yeah, so I have a, a slightly provocative question for you uh, <sighs> in response to that, which is, as if we haven't think... tried to nail you down on things already. We've had some really challenging questions. This it's time. a really challenging I topic. I almost feel bad for you. No. I know. I know. This is like a this is like a Senate Welcome conference you're hearing right now. Uh, <laughs> no, I I you say that you know the 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 goal of a lot of communication is to change an attitude or to to provoke a behavior, right? Um, do you think that a majority of public affairs professionals believe that they're capable? of doing that uh, because 
I'm, I'm afraid. And just knowing that I've been within career fields, you know, myself, where, where we're doing work where, you know, we kind of feel like it's not doing what it should be doing, but who are we to really change the system? I wonder if, if you believe that within your career field, you have the same thing where, uh, you know, maybe they don't feel like they have what they would need. Because I know as somebody who writes myself, it takes a certain audacity to be able to say, I'm going to change the world with this thing I wrote. I'm going to change, I'm going to make people behave a certain way. That takes, that takes guts and it takes a certain amount of confidence and it takes a kind of, it takes a type of creative insanity. I'll, I'll say that. Um, and I'm wondering if, like so many things that are a career field, so it's just a paycheck for some people, do we have a problem maybe within within that career field as well where they might not feel like it's even possible? Probably. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I haven't talked to every single person in my career. Sure, yeah. But, but um, I'm, I'm sure there are people who, who do feel that way. They say, hey, I, I don't actually make a difference. I'm taking pictures, I'm writing stories, I'm creating graphics, I'm, I'm speaking the truth of the Air Force and Space Force in my case. Um, and, and that's that, but I don't really see the payout of it. So a couple things. Um, I think, one, as, as an officer, as a leader, I and, and we can do a better job of, of giving people the why, like this is why it matters. This is why mm -hmm. you matter. Yeah. Um, here is how it actually affects the bigger purpose. And, and I've done that a lot. And, and I think um, it still comes back sometimes to say, I, I still don't get it. Um, and mm -hmm. I think there is a better job to be done on, on that front. But I also a lot of times talk to my airmen specifically about perspective um and and sometimes that perspective is you are not going to change the world with a singular piece of information most likely yeah. right most likely um so when you look at um an effort it is a lot of of little dots put together right you're you're talking about um a saturated ecosystem of information that you have a lot of different pinpoints that are going to tell a different picture. You unfortunately can't actually see something. Um, you you can you can envision something and and think that you're going to see what's going to happen, but you actually don't know what's going to happen until you look back and you connect those dots. And I think sometimes people forget that. Okay, yes, I did this singular thing, but I'm not actually looking back and saying, oh, okay, I did this thing that led to this thing that led to this thing that led to this thing that is also part of this thing and a bigger thing over here. And again, people probably can't see me, but I'm doing a bunch of little dots that I'm connecting, right? Yeah. Um, and and there's a perspective shift that I think we also need to look at when it comes to people have grandiose ideas oftentimes, and they think that one thing is supposed to just be this big, explosive, magnificent, I've changed the world, I am a hero. <laughs> Um, yeah. when in reality there, that doesn't exist and I'm guilty of it too. I'm like, man, that didn't go viral. Like I wanted it to. <laughs> right. But, but, um, when you take a step back and you say, okay, let me look at the collective effort that I've done and I can see how I've saturated a field in a way that I've collectively added to a lot of different narratives. I've collectively added to a lot of people's lives. I've, I've collectively enriched a lot of different things. Um, and, that I think comes with time, age, and a willingness to look at things maybe a little bit differently than you're used to. Yeah. Man, we have uh, goodness. We have been all over the spectrum today. I'll I be know. honest. I did not. I did not. Ex I did not expect that we were going to cover so many topics today. If you if you were just recently tuning in, I'll tell you, we covered about five worth five podcasts worth of, of different conversations today, and it's been awesome because and. and uh, it has been awesome because there's so many things you made a point uh, several minutes ago or, or a couple of thoughts ago um, that there is so much to the interconnectedness in, interconnectedness of not only projects but ideas of individuals of how things flow together of, of the networking that is required to be able to even get something simple done and that's really the truth I mean when we were talking about 
uh, how you know data, whether or not commanders or, or leaders like objective or quantif objectives or subjective or quantitative or qualitative data, versus communicating in, uh, with other organizations and getting out of the stove pipe mentality. And there are so many different factors. And this is one of the things I love that you said at the very beginning that I think really encapsulates this idea, is that. If you're looking at, as you look at data, if you look at data and you may say, well, there's no hard substantial numbers here. There actually are. You just have to be willing to find them in the places that they do exist and call them what they are. And, and sometimes we look at somebody's experience and say, well, you know, there's no, uh, there's no specific data that shows that this is going to work. Well, no. No, not in those terms, but you do have three very experienced people who tell you that this is going to work. Is that not a data point inside itself? In the mindset of sometimes the connectivity uh, and the efficient efficiency and the effectiveness that we're really trying to find may be right underneath our nose, but we've been defining it incorrectly the entire time. And that we have been trying to make it into something that it's actually not, and we need to just call things for what they are. So uh, that's, I know that's kind of a big kind of lofty statement, but I guess my biggest takeaway out of this whole idea is that th there are it, there are some of the things that we think that we've been looking for or things that we haven't been able to define, maybe we've just been defining them incorrectly or we've been looking for them in the wrong places. You know, I heard somebody say, you look for love in all the wrong places. Well, I think a lot of times we're looking for data and answers in all the wrong places. And we need to redefine of, of what we're, open our eyes and redefine how we're trying to find those solutions that are able to prove that there is goodness in this innovation space. And it may not be a number, it may be a person that says, hey, you need to listen to this. And again, it, it, a lot of it goes back to the culture aspect of do we trust our people based on their experiences? Um, yeah. And I think it's really interesting. And I'm sure, Dan, you can probably talk to this a, a lot as well, but you know, when they, when, they, when they look at the training that you have when you get out of the military, the commercial sector really kind of defines almost like a dollar amount of, uh, of how much training has been put into you. You have this many dollars worth amount of worth, worth of training put into you for whatever reason they find that uh, important that you know you have been educated but a lot of times because we're so close to the innovation close so close to the people that are working uh, we don't take that into account we don't take that into account for the real reality that wow you know this person has more experience in this area than i do and they think it's going to work i mean that that is not that's not nothing that's actually something that's a really good point that's a really good area yeah and, and that speaks to why we have to make sure that as we're trying to innovate or as we're trying to progress in any career field, we make sure that there are a diversity of voices in the room from different, you know, from different career fields. Uh, and we touched on it earlier, uh, and I can't kind of keep going back to it, which is this Medici effect idea, which is that, you know, if you make sure that you have the right voices in the room, then their voice, you know, like the fact that somebody is coming from a specific background might give them more weight to, to speak to whether yeah. something is going to work or not, um, which is why we we always need to kind of be looking around us at our teams and being like, are we all looking at this from the exact same angle or yeah. does somebody have, you know? Uh, and so one of my big takeaways from this conversation, honestly, is that uh, one of the biggest things we could do for innovation in any career field is make sure that we're cross-pollinating more uh, with from from other career fields, other perspectives, other uh, educational backgrounds, because I think that's a lot of where uh, Kaylee's unique viewpoints come from is that she has has kind of seen both sides of this particular mountain, yeah, and can thus so. speak to it from a cross disciplinary perspective. Yeah. So hey, as we get ready to conclude, Kaylee, uh, gonna give you the the last parting shot and probably the most important piece out of all of this. You know, we've talked about data, we talked about the di different ways of looking at it, we've talked about. Uh, seeing it for what it is and maybe redefining how we look at it and, and the validity that we find in what we have in front of us um, all the way to uh, not just public affairs, but how do we effectively communicate? How do we uh, articulate what it is where we really need people to understand? Um, how do you do that? How, how, how do you do, how do you implement those things? What, what would be one thing that you would really encourage somebody uh, as they kind of step out of this podcast into their space, into their place of work and into the innovation space and mindset, what would be the thing that you could leave them with or you would encourage them to start doing, just start doing this today. And it's going to help you to think more in those lines and to apply this to your job. Um, 
Honestly, I think it is uh, take a take a deep breath. Like that sounds so simple, um, but I think we all get caught up in what we're doing. And in order to accurately look at something, because you're always going to come to it with your own subjective mindset, and mm. and subjective mindsets are really good. But how can you how can you step back and actually look at something? And and I would honestly say take a deep breath. Um, and then the other aspect of it is take a good hard look in the mirror because yeah. you can't, um, you can't change your perspective. If you don't understand your perspective, you can't change what you're doing one <laughs> yeah. foot in front of the other. If, if you're not looking at who you are as a person, if yeah. you're not saying, yeah. this is how I think, this is how my brain works. Yeah. This is how I, this is the thing that my brain automatically goes to. Why is that? And is that the right place it should be going to? And I think, um, yeah, so taking a deep breath and then taking a long, hard look in the mirror um, so that you understand yourself to be able to um, understand why your perspective is what it is so that you can understand other people. Dan, I'm, I'm seeing a trend. I think we need to move this question <laughs> in our formats because <laughs> this question launches into a whole nother podcast inside yeah. itself. Every yeah, year. it's always like, oh, great. Okay, no, such let's a great start point. scheduling in the second episode. I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> Seriously, because I, I mean, what you hit on right there is something that is, you're right. I agree with you. To say that, I think people give it kind of this um, almost kind of pat the kid on the head. Oh, that's cute. Like, that's a cute idea. But no, seriously, like, you really need to consider evaluating why is it that you're doing what you're doing or why is it that you're thinking what you're thinking because that literally changes the course of everything you do every interaction you have every person you lead every project that you you put before every interaction it all comes down to that i mean it seriously really it seriously really does and it gives you a new perspective and i've seen people who have taken the time to invest into themselves to ask themselves why do i do the things i do and maybe get rid of the things that weren't necessarily good for them or the thought processes they had maybe bring in some new mindsets that allows them to kind of uh to put things in the right place and right order and it's amazing small changes in their life have had huge organizationally transformational impacts simply because they started doing something different in their life uh, we can't even go into it i mean that's a whole nother uh, episode yeah. itself and the the thing I immediately go to when I when I hear this, of course, I keep harping on the issue, the uh, the topic of uh, continuous discovery, and the reason that I talk about continuous discovery is because we can't assume that we are, you know, just because we were doing the right thing last week that we're still doing the right thing. We might have yeah. we might have gone off course, or maybe the target changed. Like the, it's a complex environment; things change. So one of the a couple of the practices that I found the most effective in this regard is to adopt rituals that force you to continually take to to reflect on who we are right now what we're doing what the intent of our actions are um and my fa my favorite example of that is the okr framework which objectives and key results used by a ton of organizations uh john john dewar's book uh, measure what matters he describes all these different organizations that are using okrs um and it involves it involves uh, these types of practices that uh, involve include retrospectives, which is we look at what are we doing, what should we keep doing, what should we stop doing, what should we change the way we're doing, and you do that every single week. Uh, and the be the most effective teams I've ever been on did weekly retrospectives on what we were doing culturally, but then we also did OKR kind of reflective sessions. Mm -hmm. at least once every two weeks where we'd say here are our lines of effort here is how they align with our mission and our purpose and our value that we're trying to create and here is the, our measures of effectiveness that we intended to you know the key results that we can actually say have we made progress on this so those are just a couple of things that immediately spring to mind for how you can get after it start adopting some of these rituals that force you to have reflective conversations about yeah. who we are what's the value we're bringing and are we still headed in the right direction yeah you know dan i think uh 
as we think about one of the future podcasts, I think one of the things we need to do is literally talk about some of those processes. There's some real phenomenal resources. There's some real phenomenal steps that you can take. I don't know if you follow Michael Hyatt. Um, he has a bunch of great, you know, he has a full focus planner and, and many different steps that you can take to apply to your life. To, and they're simple. Dude, they're simple things. I mean, are, simple yeah. things. Always. And simple. they revolutionize. And I don't use that word lightly. Literally revolutionize the way that you do life, how you interact with people, everything you do. And those people look at that and they say, well, you know, when you look at the multiple pillars of the Air Force, they say, well, that, yeah, you know, personal is one column you need, need to do. Dude, if if personal development is one column of the many you need to have, that column has to be the absolute biggest because it literally impacts everything else you do from finances to interpersonal relationships to business to projects to everything. Anyway, yeah. don't get me started on that. But we need to, Jordan, remind me, that's something we need to dive into because that would be huge. Okay, guys, listen, it has been awesome once again. Kaylee, thank you so much for being with us here on the Disruptive AF Podcast. We, uh, You won the award for the most diverse... <laughs> <laughs> most topics we so that we've gone topics. across we call it covered so much it was so so good thanks so much for being with us hey if you uh, if this is your first time listening to disruptive af or if you're one of our returning members and fans thanks so much for being family to the innovation network and ecosystem make sure that you hit the subscribe button you hit the like button you hit the bell on youtube to get notifications and make sure that you follow along each and every week to be able to develop yourself not only in the defense innovation space but also to pour into yourself as a leader and as an innovator guys we will see you next week kaylee godspeed to you dan jordan we'll see you next time right here on disruptive af <laughs>